Lying at your feet is a strange lamp of ancient design. Spots of gold shimmer through the thick grime that coats it. As you hunker down for a closer look, the lamp jerks slightly, almost imperceptibly. The lamp feels strangely hot to your touch. As you wipe away the years of dirt and grime, it trembles in your hand. Heavy smoke spills out of the spout of the lamp, falling to your feet, where it flows away from you. The vapor arches into the air and starts to take shape before you. Who summons m What? One of you? His face twists into a sneer and he flexes his claws. What's wrong, God Woken? Did the Seven turn you down too? Or are you here seeking even more power? I should strike you down where you stand, God Taint. Because it would be a kindness. I've known the power you feel, the promises you were made. I too was named God Woken once. My God gave it all. Power, glory, hope. It was intoxicating. Until she took it away. Deep inside, you can feel your God stirring. It's recoiling, revolted. No wonder Zor's Stissa turned this one away. Unworthy, she said. Unworthy to be in a vine. So she gave it to another. What kind of a monster gives you that power only to strip it from you? To promise you will be the light of the world and then cast you into darkness? There was so much wrong with the world. So much that I needed to fix. So I sought power elsewhere. The Void said I could have eternal power, that I could be the light of the world, and it delivered. I have power unlike any god woken, even if I lack my freedom. It laughed as I was sealed away in that lamp. Be the light of the world, god woken, it said. Even so, it was more honest than your hellish seven. I may be bound to that lamp, but I can still strike you down with a thought. Other fools will find my prison. I will have my freedom someday. And until then, I am happy to do my bit to rid the world of one god's puppet. The next passing imbecile can have your wish. What? They, they turned on mortals? I knew they were mad, but that... I've suffered enough. Why would I ever want to return to a world doomed to suffer under the gods? I should have never left the lamp. Smoke starts to whip around the base of his feet, creeping up to his body. I will not repeat that mistake. Goodbye, Rivalon. The smoke envelops the gin completely before sinking back into the lamp's spout, leaving you alone with a silent, inert lamp. The spirit looks out to sea, then to the fire roaring behind him, and whistles. Ooh-wee! Pretty cunning of them, don't you think? Light the fire and draw them in. Lohar and his cronies, of course. Ships sail past, see a guide in flame, and sploosh! Wrecked on the rocks and their goodies spilling out. Saw a big and go down just the other day. Dare say those wreckers are drowning in contraband. No wonder Top Brass figured something was up. Those Arks fellows Raymond reports to. He's the one sent me here. I'm one of them all right. Well, I was. But yeah, dwarf magisters are as rare as a three-eyed imp, but when you're hard up, well, sometimes you've got to make choices. Turns out the folks round Reaper's Cove don't take too kindly to magisters sneaking about, especially not the dwarven kind. One of them was here tending to the fire. Got me for I got him. Never got to the fire. Now I'm stuck and ships still crash. At least it's a pretty view. Oh, that's mighty kind of you. Can't very well do it myself. Well, you probably guessed that. The spirit of the dwarven battle mage gazes upon the mutilated body that once housed her. As you approach, she turns confused eyes on you. She stares uncomprehendingly at your outstretched hand, slowly raising a bewildered gaze to meet your eyes. She stares, and you feel yourself drawn into the mesmerizing source pools of her eyes. With a jolt, her life flashes before your eyes. 
you become her in her prime, battling a felled magister in a deserted clearing. Electricity crackles from your fingers as you advance upon the magister. The magister is part of something dark, something cruel, something that goes against the very fabric of your being. All bets are off. Merciless, you attack her with spell and blade. As her warm blood spurts to cover your face, you are sated. A satiety you would never speak of. A satiety that momentarily fills the emptiness within you. Wait, who are you? You can't. You can't remember. You are thrust out of the spirit's memories and back into your own sovereign mind. You see the spirit of the dwarven battle mage before you, eyes downcast now. The woods have grown chilly now that the sun has set. Annie shuffles across the picnic blanket and huddles against you for warmth. You wrap one arm around her and with the other conjure a little ball of flame in your palm. Little more than a party trick, but her eyes fill with wonder nonetheless. It's so pretty, she says, resting her head against your shoulder. I don't care what they say, what you have is a gift. She inclines her face up towards yours, lips parted slightly. You lean into her, closing your eyes. The ground drifts by hundreds of feet below you. Droplets of your blood fall away from you into space. You don't feel any pain, only a numbing cold. Your senses are fading. All you can hear is the beating of the Void Woken's wings and the beating of your own heart, only your heart is slowing. The Void Woken seems to sense that you won't make it. It unleashes an outraged screech, then releases you from its grasp. The ground rushes up to meet you. You close your eyes. The spirit tugs and tugs at the source collar around his neck, though it budges not an inch. We couldn't. I couldn't. Is it really our fault? The void woke. He gives you a look full of hope, then remembers the collar around his neck and slumps forward, letting his hands hang heavy by his sides. You shift uncomfortably as the wagon traverses a patch of bumpy ground. The magisters haven't removed your shackles, even though there's nowhere to run. You sigh and gaze outward. The landscape rolls past, empty and still. But then, you see something flying close to the horizon. Several things, in fact. You peer closer. What are those? Birds? Your eyes widen as they draw nearer. Those aren't birds. You turn around to shout a warning, but it's too late. The dwarf rocks on her haunches, gnawing at her own bloody knuckles. Her wet, fearful eyes flick to you. She lowers her fist just enough to hiss a warning. Away! Away! Too noisy! It'll come back! It'll take me too! She shrinks into the fetal position. It'll come back! It'll come back! It'll come back! It'll come back! And we'll all be eaten alive! Get away from me! You're already dead! You're eaten alive! Eaten alive! Get away from me! She clamps her hands over her ears and shuts her eyes. She rocks back and forth, deaf to your words. An ancient memory overwhelms you. You are no longer you, but you still sense source saturating the air, more than you have ever felt before. You watch a figure stride through a cavern of amethyst and rose quartz, a man. No light touches this place, yet the stones and minerals illuminate his way. The man approaches a pearl sphere atop a pedestal. He lays his hands upon it and source rushes through his fingers, and you are thrust back into reality. The memory fades, but you still sense the source the man has commanded, as if you'd possessed it for yourself. You lose yourself in an ancient vision. As the man you saw before touches the pearl orb, you begin to feel yourself be. Various shades of grey swirl across the globe's surface, then part. You are free, joined by seven others, summoned by sacrificial source. The eight of you rush forth as shadows, past the globe, past the man whose body now lies limp on the floor, past the jeweled walls. The vision ends just as you emerge from the cavern. This memory, it feels ancient, a lost place in a lost time. Get out before he knows you're here. You think I stopped to get a name? They locked him up, but he got out, and they went crazy. They all went crazy. Run. If you know what's good for you, run. You fall into another memory. You emerge from the crystalline caves, past the orange rubble jutting from the ground, and rise above a shimmering lake. 
Surrounding the lake is a throng of figures, your worshippers, our worshippers. They will deliver your rightful power to you. You will be as gods. The mob drops to its knees as one. The shimmering lake, once placid, begins to boil and bubble, draining source from every supplicant. The past fades into the present. You see through your own eyes once again. The spirit stares at you, through you. When she opens her mouth to speak, her voice seems to drift to you from far away, as if half-dreamed. We keep the shipments here. That's what's meant for ships. It ends up in our carts, trundling away. <laughs> Ox! The barrels are rolling all the way to Ox. And when they get there, the air will turn to screams. Dying, choking, screams. It woofs on the wind. The black ring choked. Ox will choke. They will all choke. Mordus? A dreamy smile spreads across her face. You don't look for Mordus. She comes back to herself for the first time and looks you in the eye. Mordus looks for you. <laughs> the dwarven woman hums to herself as she works with total focus and concentration. Her ears twitch as you approach, but she does not turn to you. Yes. She turns to peer up at you, surprise and mistrust evident in her intelligent face. And what business is it of yours, outsider? She twitches, worry creasing her forehead as she begins to stammer an answer to you. I'm, I'm fixing, uh, trying to fix up this delivery device. Same little beauty the Order used to wipe out the Black Ring with the side Order of Elves in the last war. But I've reached the end of my tinkering abilities. N not my fault. But only the original creator could fix it now. And she'll be along any day now. A lizard named Mahanig. Crazy smart, crazy all round, really. She should get here from Paradise Downs any day now. It delivers Death Bog, of course. This is a slightly modified version of what the Order used during the war. Queen Justinia's orders, of course. Can't really say any more than that to you. The spirit's hands are clamped firmly over her ears. Her mouth is firmly closed and her eyes are squeezed shut. As you reach out, you hear a dry, crackling voice. Kill the dwarves. They are not your friends. They are not your allies. They must die. They must all die. And when the eggs hatch, when beautiful life bursts forth, give yourself to it. Lay down your head and rest. Your duty will be done. Let them come. Do not fight it. Let them bite you. Let them feed. You pull away with a jerk, gasping for breath. The dwarf whimpers a little in front of you. Never thought I'd be relieved to die like that. If you hadn't come along, I would have been eaten by them damn hatchlings we were guarding. I wish I could tell you, but... My brain ain't quite straight. It's still full of Mordus's fog. All I know is I were to guard those eggs with my life. And once they cracked open, I was to lay down my weapon and let them eat me. You spared me from that at least. Thank you. Be damned if I know. We had him locked up tight in the hole beneath his office, waiting for Lohar's go-ahead before we threw him off the cliff. Then, the next thing you know, I hear this voice, his voice, telling me to kill. And my hand went for my dagger. Save me alive, the little ones. Once they burst out of their eggs, they ate me screaming. I don't understand. Why did this happen? Why wasn't the Divine here to save me? Too little, too late. I'm already dead. And Rivalon's been on its own for too long now. I can't hear nothing. Nothing but that voice. It won't stop, it never stops. 
The dwarf starts to sob quietly with his hands pressed over his ears. The dwarf snaps around to look at you, panic filling his sapphire eyes. It won't stop. Since we locked up Maldus, his voice, it just won't stop. He grabs your arm, pawing at you while his mouth moves silently. His blue eyes swirl, turning an oily black as you watch. The ghost sways from side to side, the firelight flickering through the shade of what he used to be. The spirit reaches out to you. As you touch its hand, you see flashes of its past. You see a dwarf trying to sneak into a room filled with barrels, barrels covered in the marks of death. There is a distant shout, and he bolts, scrabbling for freedom. He's chased to an office, to a vault. Guards are posted as he cowers inside, and you wait for word from Driftwood. But the words you hear aren't the words you expected. You hear the dwarf's voice. You hear whispers of violence. You hear the screams of your friends. The ghost pulls back, exhausted, and the vision fades. The dwarven woman hums to herself as she works with total focus and concentration. Her ears twitch at your approach, but she does not turn to you. Yes. What's this, woman? I know a bomb when I see it. Out with it! Ah, one of Lohar's, are you? You should know better than to stick your clumsy fat fingers in the Queen's secret operations. Beast raises his fists in a rage. You're not sure whether he intends to crush the dwarf or the machine she's tinkering with. Beast's fists slam down hard onto the device. Shards fly from it in all directions, and a red light flickers on. Looks like you've had some technical difficulties, eh? I know what you look like. I'll report you. Queen Justinia will have vengeance. As you approach the dwarven scientist, Ifan pulls you aside. I, I recognize the device on the table there. I need to talk to her. Now. You see Ifan in earnest conversation with the dwarven woman. All of a sudden, he pales and staggers backwards. The woman laughs, a tinkling sound like glass smashing on a stone floor. Ha! <laughs> you thought that was a rift portal? <laughs> Lord, no, it's nothing of this sort. It's a special device that carries only a very special cargo. Specifically, death fog. No. No. Lucian would never... Never. Ifan freezes with resolve, and a cold anger emanates from him. In one fluid move, he steps close to her, knife point to throat. Without a flicker of fear on her face, she smirks arrogantly back at him. I wouldn't go there if I were you. I work directly for Queen Justinia, and she doesn't take kindly to meddlers. And to be honest, I've reached the end of my tether with what I can do here. So, if you want to harass somebody, hang on. Hanig, the original creator, should arrive here from Paradise Downs any day now. Ifan whips away his blade and walks off. A single bead of crimson blossoms at the scientist's throat. She glares after his receding form before turning back to her work. Ifan's anger rolls off him in waves. You can feel it. He stands, fists clenched, staring at the ground. He shrugs off your touch and turns from you, eyes wet. Just give me a minute. Seven be damned! I... I just found out something terrible. Something... something I did. Back in the war, Lucian himself handed me a device. He said it was a rift portal to save the elves. So I... I raced there, faster than I've ever done anything. But it... it wasn't a rift portal at all. It was a device designed to deliver massive quantities of death fog. I can't believe that Lucian would do that. To lie to me? To use me? I ran! I tried, and all along the annihilation of the elves was in my hands. He must have been set up. But could Lucian do this? No, no, it's not possible. I intend to dig up answers by any means necessary. The creator of the device, Hanag, she's still out there. We'll find her, and when we do... I'll make sure she answers any question we care to throw at her. You made it all the way here, you creeping little maggots. Have you wriggled up to bow to me? Has Lohar sent you to beg forgiveness for his sins? My lord had faith. He came to me when Lohar failed the queen. And as a reward for my service, 
He has granted me his favor. He has granted me Mord Akane. Betraying the dwarves? Oh, you poor, sniveling idiots. You'll see. You'll see my lord's brilliance. Not in this life, but perhaps the next. Please, no! Mercy! Mercy! The master sorcerer throws up his popped, cracked arms to defend himself as you step forward. The undead dwarf looks quickly over its shoulder, his gaze darting from shadow to shadow. Of course, of course, anything, just name it. What? Source? I... The skeleton slowly lowers his arms, staring at you in disbelief. Of course. You're Godwoken. You seek power. Ultimate power. <laughs> and I worried we could not find common ground. Yes, Godwoken, I can teach you. If you swear, you won't banish me to the afterlife. The death of the flesh is one of the smallest deaths. I have not passed on to the Hall of Echoes, nor do I ever intend to. Please, Godwoken, let me walk away, and I swear I will show you all I know. That... that is not important. Just please tell me, do we have an accord or not? Please be... very well, Godwoken. Listen carefully. Source and void, day and night, love and hate. One is meaningless without the other. To grow your source, to achieve your potential, you must embrace the void. The grinning skeleton reaches into the folds of his robes and pulls out a small black mass. It's covered in veins and oozing pus. Here, Godwoken. Take a bite. The finest meal you'll find in this cave. The heart of a void woken. Your guard stirs, pushing you to eat it. Do not fear, a voice whispers. Do what must be done. Perhaps not the most appetizing thing around, but if you truly want to channel more sauce. The skeleton extends his arm, jiggling the heart towards you. A glob of dark yellow pus oozes through the bones of his palm and drips to the ground. The thick pus explodes into your mouth, coating the back of your throat. You can feel it running down your throat like rancid custard. You start to retch, your body struggling to reject this intruder, but your teeth clamp down hard on the fibrous, gritty flesh as you force yourself to chew and swallow. Deep within you, you feel something change. Your soul opens up, and you feel it swell as new channels for source start to flow through you. You swallow all you can, and despite the meat in your stomach, you feel a new space inside you, a potential waiting to be filled. There, I held up my end of the bargain. I did as you asked, and now I'm getting as far from this cave as my bones will take me. Mordus looks at you in alarm. God's graves, please be quick. He... he wanted the death fog destroyed. Once he knew his rats had found it in the Peacemaker's wreck, he wanted it destroyed. The greatest weapon Rivalod has ever seen lands in his lap, and he ordered the barrels thrown into the ocean. We couldn't let it happen. We needed it. So I... I took control. The power gifted to me. The power of Morda came. The power to bend the feeble-minded to my will, and so much more. It was a gift from... It was a gift. Ah! The Queen! It's the Queen! She saw what Deathfog did to the Black Ring. She saw it destroy the Elven Forest. She said the dwarves needed power like that. And he told me to make sure she got it. He told me to ensure they got to... <laughs> arcs. The barrels were going to arcs. I... I can't. He'll hear. He'll know. He'll find me. He'll come. You can't help. No one can help. If he makes up his mind, nothing can protect you. I can't tell you. 
Mordus takes a step back, looking about in half-crazed panic. I can't! I... I can't! Not now! It's too late! It's all too late! The dwarf sets his jaw and firmly refuses to speak until you ask him something else. So... so I'm free to go. His skull twists into a mask of rage as you raise your weapon. You scum! You heartless beasts! You... you... The frail skeleton is still screaming obscenities when you bring your weapon down, caving in his skull. The jaw falls silent, dropping to the floor with a crack, and the pile of bones lies silent. You feel newfound powers of the source course wildly through your body. Deep inside your soul, your god calls for you. It would be wise to meet with your god again by performing the Meister's ritual, here or in Siva's vault. The thought of death fog gives you pause. A weapon like that should give everyone pause. Ah, death fog. Instant victory. I always applauded Lucian for using it. I've seen this. Seen death fog in action. Such horror has no place in this world. I wouldn't use this garbage against my worst enemies. Some lines ought never to be crossed. A weapon of untold destruction? And you use this against your own kind, knowing it ends their existence? How efficient. Who wakes up in the morning and thinks, today I'll invent something that'll be able to murder people by the hundreds? This scourge, this destroyer of my people should be wiped from the face of the earth. Death fog. Nasty stuff. Overkill for a bunch of scattered rebels, though. Just any a stooping lower than even I thought possible. Ah, hard to say. That mad doctor Isbel's the one who pulls the Queen's strings. No idea who's pulling hers. All I know is that we don't want death fog catching a ride on the roaring ark's winds. Long as that stuff's around, no one's safe. The ghost stares down at his broken, twisted body, a look of glum resignation on his face. It ain't a pretty way to go. Mind you, could be a damn sight better than whatever Lohar would have done if he'd got his hands on us. Mind control or no, he'll be livid when he finds out what they... what we did. I, I'm so sorry. I didn't want to hurt you. I, I didn't want to hurt anyone. But he made me. That voice. He made me. I let him out of the vault. I killed anyone that got in the way. And then I sat here as he gibbered about needing to complete his bloody murder game. Damn divine. Some ancient ritual, he said. It gave him the power to twist our minds, to turn us into his puppets. And when he was strong enough, it turned him into... that. He thought it was a reward. Kept saying how blessed he was. What madness. Even dead, there are humans causing me trouble. You need something. Take a hoik, long shanks. Me and your belly button ain't got nothing to talk about. What's it look like? Either there were a void woken attack, or this is the most unfortunate dinner party you ever did see. Now shove off. I've got an afterlife to enjoy, and your jabbering ain't making it easy. Walk on, heartbeat. I've got nothing to say to you. The dwarf pulls a dagger with shocking dexterity and reflexively swings at your gut. Thankfully, the ephemeral blade passes right through you. With a rancid look, the dwarf pockets the knife. As he does so, you spot the royal seal of the Dwarven Queen on the handle. Through gritted teeth, the Dwarf growls. We're done here. Don't worry about it, says Lohar. Quietest work around, says Lohar. Well, I don't see him here, cold stone he's lying on. It will be fine, my ass. And here I was, the fool, believing him. The ghost swings a foot to kick its old body in frustration but the boot sails straight through her corpse. Because it's his fault. If not for him, I'd still be sitting there, wine in hand, happy as Larry. But no, he knew best. He wanted the death fog destroyed. That's why we were to make sure it got into the right hands. Our hands! I even stood guard of Mordus when he was doing nothing but the Queen's bidding. 
No wonder we came to this. This is what I deserve for following the orders of a leader with the spine of a sponge. Thank Duna, Her Majesty has more steel in her belly than that coward. You're a little tool to be asking questions like that. Her Majesty is trying to do what's best for the dwarf people. And there's not a thing more you need to know. The spirit hovers before you. It looks into your eyes and reaches out a hand of smoke and gossamer, silently begging you to take it. You feel the boards creak under your boots. The smell of salt and pitch fills your nose. You check the knots securing your cargo, hands moving over rough rope in the darkness. There's a shout from above decks, and then the world turns upside down. You're pitched violently sideways as the planks around you rip apart and black water floods in. You kick and thrash, desperately trying to reach the door to the deck above, but the current hurls you back, dashing you against boxes and broken planks. As your vision fades to black, you see the walls shudder as the peacemaker snaps in two. You awake to the flicker of torchlight and the sound of voices. Here, crack this in open. With locks like these, there'll be something good inside. You hear the snap of a latch being broken and a long, low whistle. Get word to Lohar. The Reds are shipping Deathfog. Send your fastest runner. Go! There's quick movement behind you, and a booted foot kicks your staff out of reach. You look up into the eyes of a sneering dwarf. Well now, ain't you an unfortunate little flounder? She growls before clamping her hand across your mouth and nose. Sorry, hun, no witnesses allowed. You kick and struggle weakly, desperately trying to catch a breath, but the dwarf's grip is iron. As your vision starts to swim, you see other dwarves moving in the torchlight, hauling your cargo off the ship. You give one last kick and then... darkness. Stepping back from the spirit, the feeling of her panic starts to slowly fade from your mind. Back off, pigeon! This is my bridge, and I don't suffer fools on it. The enormous, unusually red troll looms over you with his fists clenched threateningly. His expression is stern, yet you can see the tiniest twinkle in his intelligent eyes. Didn't hear me the first time, parrot! He smiles a jagged and magnanimous grin. Each pitchfork-pointed tooth seems to threaten you individually. We'll see. You want to cross my bridge? Look at this wreck! No taxpayer coin has touched it in a hot century. He kicks the edge of the bridge, sending a sizable chunk of rock flying perilously close to your eye. I'm the only thing standing between this bridge and the void. These days, everything is in decline. Well, I killed them. Nobody crosses my bridge for free, and they didn't pay the toll. Mind you, they hadn't tongues to bargain with, nor pockets for coin. But still, a troll must stand by his principles. He rubs his leathery hands together with glee. <laughs> sure, sure. One regular-priced bridge-crossing coming right up. And I don't want to hear any whiny little baby noises about it either. Well, just for you, a discount of one gold piece. Pay up, cuckoo! His eyes narrow to glinting slits, and a deep laugh shakes his whole frame. <laughs> there is one thing. The competition. Take out my competition, and I could waive the usual fee. A little magpie feather named Mog. He's not fit to be a bridge keeper. He took over the other bridge across, and he's too cheap. I can't compete with his ridiculous prices. That's a little non-committal, but I'll take what I can get around here. Grog drags a rough map in the dust of the bridge with one claw. 
He then spends an inordinate amount of time sketching a highly vulgar doodle of this Marge he wants you to take care of. There. Now, for the moment, you'll need to back off. No pay, no stay. Puss crusted rat, cack sniffing whelp. Where you hiding, daddy's boy? Where you hiding? Void walking. Void walking did not eat of my flesh. Void walking did not betray me. It were him, my boy, my Garvin. I want his head in my hands. I want his head in the dirt, sticky with worms, picked to the bones by buzzards. Bring it to me, bring it to me, head of a dog, Garvin, Garvin! Spoiled that green milk, like a stinking egg. His hands were bigger than his head. He wanted and wanted, but didn't know enough. Never enough. He'll got the business, same as he did me. Rat, pig, dog! <sighs> maggot mouth lapdog, filth-thorning freak! Human. What's the word? Ah, oh, my poor mentor. Lost to the wilds, I regret to inform you. Take it from me. Avoid the open country around here. The void woken are not to be trifled with. He looks at you with his brow knitted, lips pursed, pain painted mask like upon his face. What a loathsome thing to say to one mourning the loss of his finest friend and mentor. Good day. Always. I haven't forgotten what I've heard about the chef's mastery of the pot and cleaver. I'm simply waiting to have it proven to me. Mmm, it smells truly divine and different somehow. Perhaps a special mixture from the house? Garvin tastes the stew, then begins spooning it into his mouth. He sighs with pleasure. His eyes go wide. Oh, no. Oh, no. 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 Something isn't right. I need to go move. What was in that stew you gave me? I swear, if I could, uh, if I weren't, ah. Uh. Hmm? What? Uh, what about them? His stomach squeals like a squeezed mouse. Her munificence, Dallas the Hammer, scourge of the Void Woken, and savior of the sorcerers, upon the advice of her most sage counsel. In her capacity as the titular head of our beloved Lucian's divine order, hereby layeth bounty upon the fell sorcerer murderers of Alexander, Bishop Divine. She or he or it who slayeth said sorcerers or other sorcerers with malice or without may count upon the hammer's most benign and just benevolence. The deaths of the evil ones shall be rewarded in this life and the next. Hail to the hammer, seven times blessed. The poster flutters lightly in the breeze. It proved to be child's play to outwit her. No doubt it'll be child's play to cut her down. Slipped her noose and fought joy. I'm not too worried about slipping it again. We slipped her island without too much of a to-do. The Divine Order isn't as all-powerful as it likes to think. She seems to be out for blood. I fear I may, for once, be found lacking. No news here. Everyone wants a piece of me. Let her cower on that ship of hers and be glad the water's too foul for me to swim. Where is his head? Where is his heart? Speak! Dead! Rock, take him! Buzzards use him for a latrine! His head! I want to look into his eyes! My boy is dead! My boy! My boy is dead! The snake! He takes the head in his hands and gazes into its lifeless eyes. He tenderly strokes Garvin's head and a sad smile crosses his lips. May maggots bugger you for all time, my dear boy. You, get that map of yours on hand. I've got a little something for you. Garvin took nearly everything from me, but not nearly enough. I'll show you where to look. I feel the pull of the hall. It's my time at last. Gods, I hope I'll meet my boy again. Maybe I'll get to look him in the eye when I take his head from him again and again and again. 
Not much of a landlubber, but sometimes I get no choice in the matter. Besides, there's business to take care of. I always figured every dwarf is pure of heart when they pop out of their mamas, but we ain't born cruel. We're made cruel. That means we can be made uncruel. Not sure Lohar will ever be an upstanding member of his community, but he knows where to draw the lines. Listen, when I was wee, one of Laura's manservants used to tell an old lizard tale. Once, when the ancient empire stretched across all Revelon, there was an emperor called Reza. A good lizard, but a sickly one. Scales flaking off, eyes bugging out, that kind of thing. One day, a doctor came to him. Zen was his name, and Zen said he could cure the Emperor's disease. The Emperor agreed to his poultice of herbs and black rose petals, and it worked. The Emperor was, it seems, cured, as long as he continued treatment. This didn't please the Emperor's advisor, Gaul, however. Gaul didn't want Reza cured, for he planned to inherit the Empire. So he convinced the Emperor that someone like Zen had the power to both cure and kill. On his advice, Reza had the doctor executed. With Zen dead, the Emperor's disease returned. The sickness took him soon after. The hateful Gaul took his place, ushering in a century of misery. Yeah, not a fun story to tell a kid thinking back on it. Anywho, Isbel's been at the Queen's side for years, poisoning her mind with her filth. She's like two things from that story. She's the advisor, and she's the disease. And me, I'm going to be the cure. That metaphor works, right? I'm going with a yes. Well, the way I see it, we are supposed to learn the ways of source from these teacher people. It's like going to school. Someone learns us a lesson, and then there's a test. Beast grumbles. I don't like tests. And then there's Justinia. I've got to get to Arx, and soon, if I want to keep that death fog out of her hands. <laughs>